Today I'll be comparing the views between those who believe that the Earth is billions of years old and those who do not. Hello everybody and welcome to Theology 101. This is the fourth topic from the Versus series. I want to remind you that all the views I'll be covering in this series are within the realm of orthodoxy. And so these are disagreements between brothers and sisters in Christ and shouldn't be a reason to call somebody a heretic over. Now with that in mind, the two views I want to cover today is Old Earth and Young Earth Creationism. Old Earth Creationism believes that a strictly literal approach to Genesis 1-2 to is not the correct way to read these chapters. Instead, they view these chapters as symbolic or poetic. Old Earth Creationists view that the scientific methods and the data we have today are reliable and therefore accept that the Earth and universe is billions of years old. Young Earth creationists interpret Genesis 1-2 as a literal historical account. They argue that scientific data supporting a billions of years old universe is interpreted incorrectly or is based on false assumptions. Both Old Earth and Young Earth creationists are trying to deal with the apparent discrepancy between Genesis 1-2 and the scientific information we have today. If Genesis 1-2 is interpreted literally, then it will indicate that the Earth and universe is only thousands of years old. However, various scientific methods and data has indicated that the Earth is billions of years old. Both young and old Earth creationists believe in the inerrancy and the infallibility of scripture. What they disagree upon is how to interpret Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now let the debate begin! Since we consider the entire book of Genesis as historical narrative, we don't see any reason why we should read the first two chapters any differently. The phrase evening and night is seen after each day showing that the days in Genesis 1 do not refer to millions of years, but refer to a literal day. Also notice how many times the author writes it was so to indicate that his recording of the creation account is exactly how it actually happened. Genesis chapter 1 to 2 uses the vayiktol 55 times. This Hebrew conjunction is used to connect successive events and is primarily used in historical narrative. Also, Hebrew poetry would often use parallelism, which is to repeat a similar idea with different expressions. Genesis chapter 1 to 2 does not have any example of parallelism. The word day in the Bible can refer to a period that is longer than 24 hours. For example, Psalm chapter 90 verse 4 uses the word day to refer to a long period. The apostle Peter cites this verse in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 when he says this, a day is like a thousand years. Genesis chapter 2 verses 2 to 3 says that God rested on the seventh day. But the author of Hebrews says that we are still living in that seventh day of rest. So if the seventh day can symbolically refer to a period that is longer than 24 hours, so can also the previous six days symbolically refer to a period that is longer than 24 hours. Also, Genesis chapter 2 verse 19 says that Adam named all the animals in one day. This task would have been impossible to do in 24 hours. You mentioned how the phrase evening and morning appears after each day, but this phrase also appears in the first three days before the sun and moon were created. So what kind of days were the first three days? They could not refer to a 24-hour period because you wouldn't have a 24-hour day until the sun and moon were created. You mentioned that Genesis 1 to 2 should not be read as a poem because there's no parallelism. But you do see chiasm, which is a figure of speech used in Hebrew poetry, where the grammar of one phrase is inverted in the following phrase to emphasize a concept. Genesis 1 to 2 also uses the poetic element of inclusio which is like bookends where a beginning and the end of a section are repeated with similar phrases. Although there is no parallelism found in Genesis 1-2, there are other poetic elements. And even though the Vayik told shows up many times, these chapters do not follow the typical structure of Hebrew narrative. It seems like Jesus read Genesis chapter 1-2 as historical narrative. In Matthew chapter 19 verses 4-5, when talking about divorce, Jesus quotes Genesis 1-2 by saying, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Adam and Eve were real people who were created in the beginning to be married to only each other. He wants to remind his listeners when they were created so they will know that this is the way God always intended it. So Jesus' point is to show his audience that divorce goes against the original design of God. The argument will only make sense if Genesis 1-2 was meant to be read as a historical narrative. Also, Jewish customs typically come from historical narratives. For example, the Passover was celebrated in commemoration of the actual historical event when God delivered Israel from Egypt. The Jewish Sabbath was based on the creation account, when God worked for six days and rested on the seventh in order to establish a pattern for his people to follow. So if Jewish customs were typically built on historical narratives, this seems to apply that Genesis 1 to 2 is supposed to be read as a historical narrative since later customs such as the Sabbath depend on Genesis 1 to 2. 
It seems that the only reason why someone would read Genesis 1 to 2 in a symbolic or poetic way is because of the recent scientific findings that we have. Why should we change the way we read Genesis 1 and 2 in order to make it fit with science? Science shouldn't be the final authority of how we read scripture. Now, I don't read Genesis 1 to 2 symbolically just because of science alone. It's also because I don't think that's the intention of the author. I don't think the author of Genesis was writing a scientific textbook giving details of exactly how God created the world. Instead, he's just giving a general overview using poetic language to say that God is the creator of the world. Now, there's a problem if you do read Genesis 1 to 2 literally, because there are some things in it that have proven to be untrue. For example, ancient Near Eastern people believed that a dome surrounded the earth and separated the waters from the sky from the waters on the land. Genesis 1 describes this as a firmament. We see that on the third day, that the waters below the firmament was gathered to create the sea. We also see that Job believed that this firmament was made out of lead. Later on, Ezekiel says that this firmament was made out of sapphire. So if you take the creation account literally, then you would have to believe that there was a solid dome surrounding the earth. But we know that that is not true. Now I know your camp likes to argue that the firmament is not solid, but refers to a watery atmosphere. During the Noahic flood, this atmosphere dropped like an atomic bomb on the earth and flooded the entire world. But the rest of the Old Testament seems to believe that this firmament was solid. This suggests that the author of Genesis was not giving an accurate scientific description of how the world was created, but from his cultural understanding and language, he was describing in a poetic way that God is the creator of the world. What did you guys think? We'll have a second part to this debate, so please make sure to subscribe and find out when the next video gets released. If you found this video helpful, please like and share it with a friend, and until next time, see you!